Game day on Gamecock Central Radio. Emerson Phillips, Wes Mitchell, Chris Clark. Glad to have you along today. South Carolina and Arkansas on a 4 o'clock kickoff at williams Bryce. Chris, Wes, good to have you today. What's going on? Uh, hanging out, man. Ready for uh, another big game, obviously, for, for South Carolina. And, uh, guys, I, uh, I think that as far as the game, you know, as far as the way this season is going to go, Chris, this feels like a swing game for me because I don't know about you, but four and two uh, just feels a lot different than uh, three and three. It does. And, you know, the early part of the schedule before the season started, we all looked at it and say, you know, what are the swing games? What are the games that they really need to pick up wins in um, in order to, you know, leave themselves some wiggle room to get to bowl eligibility to get to that sort of season threshold that they want to get to? And, Given the way that it's played out, um, you know, some of those games, those swing games South Carolina won, or at least the games we thought they were going to be swing games, and then they dropped one we thought they'd win in Kentucky. And so now this one has become uh, all the more important. So I definitely agree with you on that point. All right, fellas, we got plenty to talk about today. And, you know, I, I suppose we should start with David Williams. I think this is one of the more interesting storylines, and David has been off limits with the media. So David Williams graduated from South Carolina and transferred to Arkansas, and he's played right away this year, and he's been very productive. I mean, you could argue that he's been more productive through the first four games of the season for Arkansas than he was uh, in any single year at South Carolina. He's on his way to having a much better year for the Razorbacks than he ever had for the Gamecocks. So you got to feel good for a kid like this who uh, came to Will Muschamp, and Muschamp talked this week about the fact that he's got a lot of respect for David Williams for the way he handled the situation. He went to him and he said he wanted a clean slate. He wanted a fresh start, and he got that at Arkansas. So good to see him doing well. Yeah, and, you know, Dave, David's a guy that, um, you know, he had some ability out of high school, certainly, and he just never really clicked at South Carolina. Some of that was, I think, because of the guys he had in front of him uh, at points during his career. And uh, then there were other times where <clears throat> really the opportunities just weren't maximized. And I think Arkansas, it just seems to be a, a you know, a better fit for him offensively. And so, um, you know, it, he's had a good start to the season. Uh, certainly it's good to see him, you know, rebound and, and get back on track with his career. And I know for South Carolina, the hope is that, you know, it doesn't come back to bite them and, um, certainly they got uh, Williams and Devwell Whaley and Chase Hayden, who's a guy that South Carolina recruited some out of high school. And uh, they'll be looking to try to limit all those guys as much as possible. Yeah, and I think that this offense he's in now uh, with with a lead blocker and sort of, uh, you know, I, I think with, with David Williams, you never really doubted the fact that he was a big, fast kid. But uh, I think at, at times uh, didn't run as hard as you thought he might as far as being able to break tackles. And um, – at times, uh, I, I thought didn't see the holes necessarily as well out of this, you know, spread type offense. So I think you put him in a downhill uh, running based attack with a lead blocker, and you have these massive offensive linemen, and you tell them, "Hey, just just follow, you know, follow your lead blocker and uh, and find some space." I, I think that you've seen that sort of result in in a, a better situation for him as far as a scheme fit. And uh, I think uh, that that's probably made his confidence go up a little bit too. Plus, hey, every guy, it seems like to me, sort of maybe takes it to a little bit different level when you tell them that, hey, this is your final go, this is your final chance, final opportunity. And uh, certainly David Williams is making the best of that. And, you know, they, they've got three backs, but David is right there in that mix. And uh, I think one of the most interesting thing about this sort of approach for Arkansas is that all three backs have very similar – snaps, number of carries, and actually very similar production as well. So they get all three guys involved and and keep them all fresh, it seems. All right, so David Williams certainly makes this game a little bit more interesting. We had an Arkansas podcast. We previewed Arkansas earlier this week and got the Arkansas perspective from Trey Biddy, the publisher of hogsports.com, our rival's partner. And he said that uh, he feels like David Williams is Arkansas's best running back in terms of uh, all attributes, you know, ability to run the football, short yardage back, pass protection, everything wrapped into one. He feels like Williams is the best that Arkansas has got. So interesting also, fellas, that Williams never gained 300 yards in a single season at South Carolina, and he's already got over 200 for Arkansas, and I believe he's got four touchdowns this year. So, you know, it makes sense that if you're running back, you'd like to be in a system like the one that Arkansas runs, and that brings me to the next talking point today, and that is this high formation, this power ground game that Arkansas brings in. The Gamecocks just don't see it a lot. You know, that's because a lot of offenses, uh, a lot of schools don't run this type of offense anymore. So it represents an interesting challenge 
challenge and something a little bit new, Chris, for uh, the Gamecock defense. Trey Biddy said that Arkansas would like 65-35 run pass. For sure. And, you know, another point that Trey made in our uh, Behind Enemy Lines feature that he did with us, and may have mentioned this, I'm, I'm not remembering on the podcast, is that, you know, in the first couple games of the season, Arkansas was closer to a 50-50 situation. And so um, – in terms of run pass ratio. And as, as you said, Emerson, Trey passed along that they'd like to get more back to that running game. Now, their quarterback, Allen, is a capable guy. Uh, they mix in their tight ends well. Dan Enos, their offensive coordinator, always does a really good job with that. They can go play action. But their bread and butter is going to be the run. And so <clears throat> if they indeed want to try to get back to that ratio, that's the really interesting aspect of this game to me because – I believe, based on eye test and statistics, if you go and look at the statistics in terms of yardage in the game and yards per carry this season, South Carolina is better against the run through the first five games than they were last season. Now, whether or not that holds, we'll see, um, because they'll play Arkansas, they'll play Georgia, some other teams that can be very effective running it. Um, But in terms of stats and eye tests, they look a lot better. And so this, this, however, will present a unique challenge. This isn't a team running the ball out of the spread. This is a team going downhill, power run, I formation, have some different backs. They have a wildcat package they can throw at you with Hayden. So um, it'll be really interesting to see what South Carolina can do against, and it's going to be a key in the game for them, for South Carolina to try to put Al- Arkansas out of their element a little bit and try to make them unbalanced. And, it, and I feel like uh, looking back at some of their games, um, at times when they've gotten, like you said, away from that split, they've also tried to – sort of incorporate all this different more new school type stuff more modern approach and uh, I think that they have to do that to an extent to sort of keep teams honest and you know they, they'll attach the bubble screen to their running game like most every team does they use the jet sweep and stuff but it looked to me like against New Mexico State they got back to sort of their bread and butter and, and what they're all about um, you know I, I know uh, Trey Biddy said that David Williams is you know overall in his opinion, their best back. But I, I tell you, the kid I really, really like is uh, Chase Hayden. He's a, a freshman um, that has rushed for, uh, I think, 246 yards already in his career in four games. As a guy that South Carolina recruited pretty heavily at one point, had the Gamecocks as a leader at one point. They, of course, decided not to take a running back in the 2017 class. But uh, the quickness that this guy has, um, his ability to sort of jump cut and, and change your – sort of vision point for linebackers and and sort of find a hole it is very very impressive so this kid's explosive not the biggest back but i'm a big fan of of him and they'll they'll line him up in sort of their version of the wildcat the wild hog and uh then on top of all that uh, they'll they'll sort of put their backup quarterback which is very very unique this cole kelly kid who's like six seven six eight uh literally 270 pounds he looks like an offensive lineman They'll put him in their their wild hog, what they call um, the steamboat package, and and run him in short yardage, and that's been very very successful. So, uh, you know, A and M last week provided a threat uh, in the running game, but Arkansas is going to provide a threat in the running game that's just completely different in structure and in thought process and philosophy, but a, a big threat nonetheless. Yep, and Wes, if Arkansas is able to establish the run, that enables them to do a couple of things. Number one, it allows them to control time of possession. They control the clock when they run the football, and it also sets up their play-action passing game, which is very effective once they've established the run. They're not a prolific passing team, but Austin Allen can hurt you, particularly when they get that run game cranked up. So, you know, I, I'm worried about the Gamecock defense getting tired again today. We've talked extensively this year about the fact the Gamecock defense has been on the field too much. And if Arkansas is able to get running downhill today, the Gamecock defense is going to have a long day. They're going to be out there a long time. Yeah, and Austin Allen, I, to me, is probably one of the more underrated quarterbacks in this conference. Um, he uh, he passed for over 3,000 yards last year. He threw for 25 touchdowns, also had 15 interceptions, but is not a guy to me that that gets mentioned um, in that sort of upper tier of quarterbacks in this league. But uh, the guy can get it done. He's a good scheme fit for what they do. Uh, the, like you said, they'll, they'll use the running game and set up the throw game, play action pass. Uh, they like to hit their tight ends over the middle. Um, they like to sort of use the screen game off of play action with misdirection. So they do a lot of different things to you. And the thing I like about this Austin Allen kid is 
you know, as good as Arkansas's offensive line has been in the running game, to me they have struggled at times in pass protection, and I think part of that is because of the type of guys they recruit um, for that running game. They're not as athletic. They've struggled in pass pro, but this Austin Allen kid will stand in there, deliver the football, and take a shot. And he's uh, he's taken a lot of shots during his career. He's a tough kid. He'll deliver the football. Um, I'm not necessarily sure he's quite an elite quarterback, but he's on that he's on that level to me of a guy that can get get it done in this conference. So uh, I'm a big fan of what he can do in their offense, and I, I think that's something else for South Carolina. If you if you s- slow him down in the running game on first and second downs then that's when they have to become a more traditional football team in the sense of they will get in the shotgun they'll drop back and throw if it's third and seven eight nine something like that they automatically become a more uh, a team that's more common as far as what they do scheme wise so it's it's something South Carolina sees every week at that point and they're not necessarily good at that I, I think the receivers are young inexperienced they've come on a little bit the last week or so but if South Carolina puts Austin Allen and Arkansas in a throw game, then all of a sudden they quickly have some of these same issues we've seen South Carolina's offensive had, uh, especially late against Texas A&M. Chris, if the Gamecocks can limit Arkansas running the football, obviously on first down and kind of put them behind the chains, put them behind the sticks and down in distance, that's going to help South Carolina, obviously. And I think Gamecock run defense has been improved this year, but again, a different style of offense that Arkansas brings in, and it represents a new test. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and like Wes hit on, they do a lot of different things, but um, it's it's going to be a challenge. I mean, there's one thing. It's one thing to say, look, you got to limit them on first and second down from running the ball, and then you got to get them to third and long, and then go rush the passer and try to get after them. And, and take them out of their element. That's easy to say, but you got to go out and execute it. And so we have seen South Carolina improve this year. Again, statistically, eye test, all those things look better. Not perfect, but looks a lot better. I mean, you look at how they played. Even in losses against Texas A&M and Kentucky, they played the run, in my opinion, quite well. They had a, they had a couple runs against A&M where the quarterback, Kellen Mond, got loose. They won't see that level of elusiveness or speed this week. And then A&M's got – you know, everybody thinks about their passing game, but they got a couple backs who are really good, and we saw them get loose a couple times, especially later in the game. But, but USC's done a nice job. But this again, this will be a totally different attack. It'll be sort of difficult for them to simulate and practice, and so they'll have to go out and and you know apply what they've been taught in terms of their improvements with strength and movement and, and being able to get off the ball. But you know, Emerson, I think on, on the other side of it, it's going to be very important for South Carolina to make offensive improvements too. And, you know, getting off the field on third down will be key because there's a huge disparity um, last week where South Carolina wasn't awful on third down against A&M. They had some big back-breaking one type ones later in the game, um, but they were really bad on third down offensively, and they've been very poor in the red zone. They're, they're only five teams nationally worse than South Carolina in the red zone offensively in terms of producing points. They've only scored 66% of the time. Um, and that's not good enough. And, and part of it's been, you know, field goal struggles. They've had turnovers, but they're going to have to convert. You know, uh, you can't you can't go through a season, and go through games like that, and only score sixty six percent of the time when you get down there and, and win on a consistent basis. This is Gamecock Central's Game Day Podcast. Emerson Phillips, Wes Mitchell, Chris Clark. Glad to have you along today. We're going to get to the Gamecock Central Hotline in a moment. We're taking your phone calls at eight zero three. Four nine seven ninety fifty eight. The Gamecock Central Hotline is set up for you. Four nine seven ninety fifty eight. Call in, leave us a voice message, and Chris and Wes will answer your calls on a future edition of Gamecock Central Radio. And we want to invite you to download the Gamecock Central Radio app. It's on the App Store and on Google Play. Subscribe to our podcast. Search for Gamecock Central Radio on iTunes, SoundCloud, and other popular services, or just visit radio. dot gamecockcentral. dot com. Arkansas is two and two coming in. They're zero and one in the league. South Carolina three and two overall, and one and two in the SEC. So, fellas, obviously Texas A and M is the one common opponent that these two teams have this year. Arkansas scored forty three on A and M, but lost by seven in overtime. And the Gamecocks couldn't hold a ten point second half lead and lost also by seven. It was twenty four seventeen. So I, I don't know what to make of these two teams based on the Texas A&M performance, or at least, you know, their performances against A&M. I don't know if we're going to have a high-scoring game today. I thought the Gamecocks would be able to score after I watched A&M go up and down the field on Arkansas. 
Uh, and Arkansas score a lot of points in that game as well. I thought the Gamecocks would be able to score against A and M, but they they just didn't do it. And I don't know what to expect today, Wes. Yeah, I, th- I think it's hard to say as well. Um, and, and all these games are going to stand on their own merit. And I, I think, like we talked about going into the A and M game, South Carolina certainly is is missing some of its pieces really bad right now. Some of its better players. I I, I think um, it, the most sort of uh, maybe confusing thing, I, I guess, would be the way to say it, is how South Carolina's offense has just at times had uh, sequences where they've went, you know, looked really, really good. You know, there was a section of that game uh, where for about 27 plays, South Carolina got 270 of its yards. So you're talking about basically 10 yards per play. Uh, that was in the middle portion of the A&M game, the end of the second quarter. Uh, or most of the second quarter, I should say, into about halfway through the third. But you look at the first part of the game in the first quarter, and then obviously the final half of the third quarter and the fourth quarter, and, and South Carolina could barely even make a first down. So uh, there's been consistency issues for South Carolina. I tend to think um, that the offense is going to have a chance to put up some points this week. Uh, maybe in the minority on that. But uh, to me, w- one thing's been sort of a a constant has been when South Carolina can protect Jake Bentley, and I'm going back to last year too, ever since Jake Bentley took over. um, When South Carolina's been able to protect the quarterback, they've been able to move the football and have some success on offense. When they haven't, everything's gotten bogged down. And I I think looking at Arkansas, they've made this change to the 3-4 defense. They don't really have any elite pass rushers. They only have 18 tackles for loss this year in four games. That's last in the SEC they're second to last in sacks in the SEC. Uh, to me, if there was ever a good matchup for South Carolina at home, um, you know, it, it, it sets up well for them to score some points, I think. So I, I think Carolina's offense um, is going to put up some points if the weather does not affect this thing. That's the other variable that nobody's really talking about yet. But uh, last I checked, um, there is a chance of some rain. And that, to me, would be something that would not be good for South Carolina when sort of play into Arkansas's run-first nature. So uh, if, if there's no rain, then I actually like South Carolina's chances to, to put up some at least some yardage. And then, clearly, like we've talked about all year long, they they got to fix the red zone stuff because um, if the red zone stuff doesn't get fixed, then all the yardage in the world is not going to matter uh, because it's not going to result in as many points. All right, boys, we probably could have started the podcast today talking about Gamecock injuries, but we opted instead to start with David Williams, the former Gamecock who's now running back at Arkansas and you know will likely want to be a, a major player in Arkansas's game plan today and would love to come back to Columbia and beat the Gamecocks. But, Chris, you talked about you know the importance to show some improvement on offense, and I just think that's going to be hard to do with – we got two starting linemen – out today or two offensive linemen out today Corey Helms and Malik Young and Zach Bailey's doubtful so you know the Gamecocks gave up seven sacks last week against Texas A&M and we're down all three linemen for a portion of that game and I just to me Chris with all these offensive linemen out and Debo Samuel out and Bryson Allen Williams out on the defense you know it's just hard to progress when you don't have your best players on the field now you know that that's easy to say and that's that's an obvious excuse if you let it become one, but the Gamecocks are just not in position to let that be an excuse. They've got to find a way to get better, even though they're they're shorthanded again this week. Yeah, you're right. I mean, nobody around the program wants to use it as an excuse. You got to acknowledge it at real as reality, and you got to understand how it can affect your game plan, how it can affect your performance, how effective you are. But you know, it, it's it's very difficult to be down three offensive linemen, and you look even at the A and M game. You know, since Donnell Stanley moved over to the right side uh, in that game uh, when Sedarius Hutcherson was inserted uh, at left guard, they had one player, and that was Alan Nott at center, who was playing his original position, you know, from the beginning of the season. I mean, they didn't have Malik Young at left tackle. Um, They didn't have, you know, Corey Helms in there. They didn't have Zach Bailey at right tackle. Stanley was in a different spot. So, I mean, that makes it tough, and – you know, even then they got by in the A&M game for a while and then really, really started struggling late uh, once the game sort of changed. And so uh, it's something that they have to account for in their game planning to figure out what can we call, what's going to work, are we going to be effective? I think the, f- the feel that I get is that there's still some frustration despite those injuries, despite not having Debo Samuel, one of the best playmakers in the country, and despite not having 
three offensive linemen, um, guys that with a lot of experience and, and a guy in Zach Bailey, who's your best offensive lineman, you know, uh, they still feel like they need to be more productive, even given that. And so that's telling. And, and like Wes has been talking about, um, some of those things are things that, you know, you, you need to control better regardless of circumstance. They got to do better in the red zone. They're going to have to figure out some calls that work, even though in some ways they may be a little bit more handicapped now. Um, so they're going to have to be creative. They're going to have to execute. Um, at, at times, they're going to have to be more flawless, really, uh, frankly, in terms of their execution. And they're just going to have to find some ways to get it done. And, and running the ball would, would certainly help open those things up a lot. I think the picture offensively will look better later in the year once they can get these guys back healthy. Uh, but for now, that's a, that's a big question mark. So, Wes, we've talked about the Carolina running game and the fact that uh... – you know, the Gamecocks struggled off- offensively last week, obviously, and I, I think a lot of it's got to do with the fact that the run game just has not given the Gamecocks enough this year. Muschamp talked earlier this week about the fact that, you know, if you take away the lost yardage from the seven sacks last week, the Gamecocks' ground game numbers were not bad. But the simple fact is that the Gamecocks have not been balanced enough to help take some pressure off of Jake Bentley in that passing game. And before we started the podcast today, uh, you and Chris were talking about Tyson Williams and the fact that he's averaging over five yards a carry. So what are the Gamecocks going to have to do to improve this running game today against you know what we feel like could be a, a vulnerable or a susceptible Arkansas defense? What will Carolina need to do to establish the run game, take some pressure off of Bentley in the passing game, set up favorable down and distances, and give themselves more balance offensively, get Tyson Williams more involved, and hopefully he'll have a big day today. What's that going to take, Wes? Yeah, I wish I had a, uh, an, a an answer for how to do it. Uh, for one, they're you know they're going to have to execute better. I you know I, I think I was trying to sort of come to terms with that fact of how is Tyson Williams averaging so many yards per carry, but the offense has been so bad in the running game. And I went back and looked. This is A and M only, but uh, in compressed field situations where basically the other team doesn't have to worry about the deep ball. So red zone or like a third and short, fourth and short type situation. South Carolina had five of those scenarios in which it ran the football against A&M. And on those five carries, it got a total of negative three yards. Uh, That was three red zone carries, one carry from the 21, which I counted anyway, and then a third and one that was stopped for no gain. So, you know, South Carolina has ran the ball from a average yards per carry standpoint decently, I would say. Not good, but at least below average to average in sort of regular down situations. I think it's more uh, when they have to run the football in the red zone in short yardage that they have failed to do. Now, some of that, like I said, they're just going to have to play better. Two, I think when they get in third and short, they're going to have to actually start using the play action game more and putting it on put even more on Jake Bentley. They're gonna have to throw the ball on your third and ones and your third and twos. Now, I think a big issue for South Carolina going back to third down is this stuff is all tied together, man. I, I think you look at South Carolina's play distribution against A and M on first down, uh they ran the ball twelve times, they passed the ball thirteen times. So you have great balance. But South Carolina was actually in sixteen different second down and long situations so to me why do you not convert third downs because you're not getting productivity on second down south carolina on their first downs was able to hit a bunch of sort of chunk plays medium range 12 yards here 13 yards there and they're able to move the football when they do that but when they don't hit those plays on first down when they have to throw and they end up in second and 10 to give you an example south carolina was in 16 second and longs a&M was in 18 second and longs. So A&M's even in more of those situations in South Carolina, but A&M was able to run the football on 11 of those plays and pass it on seven. So you can tell when A&M's in a second and long, they're comfortable in their offense to pick up three, four, five, six yards to put them in a manageable situation. The fact South Carolina doesn't trust its running game can be depicted in this number right here. On the 16 second and longs, South Carolina threw the ball 13 times and only ran the ball three times. So 
If you trust your running game, you're going to run on second and long, get yourself in third and manageable. If you don't trust your running game, you have to throw on second down. So to me, that's where the inconsistencies of this offense comes. If you're hitting your first and second down passes, South Carolina's moving the football. If it's incomplete on first down, they feel like they have to throw on second down. If that's incomplete, you're in third and long, and then you get sacked or pressured. So uh, I think if you break down the numbers, you can tell not only is South Carolina – not successful in the running game because of that they don't trust their running game either all right we got a four o'clock kickoff today for south carolina and arkansas and wes you said it's a swing game you know to me the gamecocks gotta have this game today playing at home you know we've talked all year about how the schedule gets a lot tougher over the second half of the season and four o'clock kickoff at williams bryce the gamecocks you know they haven't been particularly impressive at home this year losing to kentucky in that blackout game a few weeks ago the home opener and then struggling for three quarters before scoring 17 in the fourth and rallying to defeat uh, Louisiana Tech in the second home game of the year. Gamecocks need to come out and play well at home. I think that would do the fan base a lot of good, and if Carolina can win this game today, they level their mark at 500 in the SEC, and you feel a lot better going into Tennessee next weekend and then the bye week the week after that. But if you fall to Arkansas today, Wes, you know, it really feels like it's going to be a long year. It, it really does, and uh, I think um... – Man, you look look even ahead to next week. Uh, Tennessee, uh, it is a road game, but it's at noon. Uh, the natives are restless over that way. I, I can't imagine it's going to be an incredibly um, just raucous atmosphere by any means. Uh, you'll probably have just as many people yelling at Tennessee players as you do South Carolina players as far as negative stuff goes. So, uh, dude, it, it, it just sets up pretty well. If they win today, then I, I think all of a sudden they feel really good about going bowling and maybe even sort of starting to have that seven-win conversation. If they lose today, then I, I think you're really concerned about their ability to get ball eligible, and it sort of becomes like last year where it's a fight, it's a battle. So um, I, I think that's been the frustrating thing for South Carolina fans too, man, is that this conference, top to bottom, uh, certainly at the top is very good, but uh, medium to bottom of this conference, it, it's not – it's not elite. It's not great. So there's room for upward mobility for teams like South Carolina. They just have to take advantage of it. So um, that said, recruits don't care how you get to seven or eight wins. They just see that number and see you're making progress. So there, there's nothing to be shamed of for taking advantage of an SEC conference that's down in the middle and at the bottom part. So South Carolina certainly has to just take advantage of that at this point. Um, you know, they, they talked a lot, Emerson, about sort of uh, putting the rest of the season behind them and moving on. Muschamp talks all the time about it being a one-game season. Uh, l- last week, to me, nobody expected South Carolina to beat A&M. It's a road SEC game against a pretty good opponent. But this week is the one you circle and say the Gamecocks need to win this game. And really, uh, I think if they win today, man, they're feeling really good going to Knoxville next week. Yeah, Chris, it feels like the Kentucky game just completely deflated the Gamecocks season. Debo got hurt. The Gamecocks were flat and got beat by Kentucky for the fourth year in a row. They're one and two since that Kentucky game, and they struggled. You know, we're really very fortunate to come back and beat La Tech. So uh, momentum is what the Gamecocks need right now. And, Wes, you talked about the natives being restless in Knoxville. There were fist fights in the stands last week when Tennessee got trucked by Georgia 41 nothing at home. Mm-hmm. Vols fans fighting Vols fans in the bleachers, man. It was crazy. So uh, talk about getting a little bit of momentum going into Tennessee, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the way I see it, too, what you said, Emerson, about the Kentucky game because, look, the L.A. Tech game was ugly for South Carolina, but the bottom line is they won the football game. I mean, we've seen some really good college football teams, even some that have gone on to win a championship, just have sort of one of those games every year where it's sort of a what the heck happened, and you know, but they end up winning or sometimes even end up losing a game. Um, and I'm certainly not <laughs> classifying South Carolina as a championship team. I'm just saying it can happen. I think what has deflated everybody is is the injury situation, the struggles that the offense has had at times, because that's something interesting maybe we had not talked about enough, is going into this season, I thought that South Carolina was going to have to win some games 45-42, to 42, and the offense was going to carry the season and carry the chances of success, and it's really been the opposite a lot of the time. The Kentucky one, you know, is the one that sticks in Gamecocks fans' crawls, I think, is because – that's a game you should not have lost. You just did not play well at all. You lose Debo Samuel um, for, for quite some time, top playmaker, and then on top of it, you lose the game. You know, did anybody really 
I mean, should the expectation have been for this team in year two to go and play an A&M team with a lot of NFL talent in College Station where they expected to go win that game? No. And they beat an NC State team that's pretty good. They did lose to Kentucky. That shouldn't have happened, you know, especially in hindsight. But, you know, they really have lost at this point one game that they shouldn't have lost. And so I know fans want to win every game, don't want to use that as an excuse. But I don't think the Kentucky contest needs to be some, uh, you know, microcosm for the entire season. I think th- these next two games – will really be a key to the year, the Arkansas and Tennessee game. And and this week could be big in terms of establishing uh, some momentum. All right, fellas, let's take a look at the recruiting angle this week. And, you know, one of the players that I'm really excited about is Dax Holyfield, this kid out of North Carolina who has narrowed his list to five uh, fellas. And, you know, he's been – he hasn't been very solid on – as far as listing a favorite, he's been kind of aloof throughout the recruiting process, and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But we got South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia Tech, Florida State, and Stanford, and Dax Holyfield will be at the Arkansas game today visiting South Carolina. Yeah, and I, I think a, a big weekend, guys, for, for South Carolina. Uh, you know, you got Dax in. You also have Israel McQuamu, who is a former Berkeley High kid that's in uh, Louisiana now, committed to Florida State four-star safety on Rivals.com. But as far as Dax goes, like you said, he's a kid that sort of enjoyed the process. I I think um, it hasn't really been the fact that he's gone back and forth on a number of schools hasn't really been about attention. I, I think Dax, if you talk to the kid, just legitimately likes all these coaches. He likes all the schools. He likes what they're telling him. He likes the opportunity to play early. And um, actually one of one of my favorite kids in the class to, to really talk to if you just get to chat with him in person. So he's got a cool personality and is very, very uh, – he, he kind of gets influenced when he goes on these visits. So, you know, I, I think a, a big visit for South Carolina. They need to play well against the run. Um, it seems like every game Dax goes to, the uh, team he's going to see loses too. So it would be nice for South Carolina if they could you, – you never put it in, you know, on one game, obviously with the recruit. But, Chris, I, I think it would be nice for South Carolina if they had a good showing, those linebackers had big days, and the Gamecocks won the game um, – in front of Dax Holyfield. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because like you said, that, those the things he's mentioned in his recruiting process. He wants to win, uh, and, and he wants to go to a place where he can play early. Now, we know South Carolina has that early playing time to offer, uh, for sure, and they've played several freshmen. Um, they played newcomers this year at linebacker, too, uh, multiple linebackers. And so, uh, you know, it's just about showing progress, and that's not something just for Dax. That's for other guys, too. And they'll have a lot of underclassmen on campus, um, not not the biggest group that they'll have all year, but they'll have a solid group of underclassmen and then a couple official visitors, including Dax. And so uh, everybody sort of wants to know where things stand with them, you know, talk about leaders. And he's one where you just really can't peg things. I mean – Time will tell. I don't think this weekend even, even though it's an official visit, it's not going to give us an answer on if South Carolina will land at Soli Field or if Virginia Tech will or anybody because he still has official visits to uh, at least two other schools scheduled and maybe one to Stanford in January, and it's it's going to be a long Fellas, process. Fellas, I'm not going to lie, man. I, I've watched tape on Dax Holyfield, and there's just something special about the way this kid plays the game. Marcus Lattimore tweeted at uh, Dax Holyfield that, he told Dax that he plays the game in a unique way. And, and Wes has talked about Dax Holyfield's ability to dissect plays. Man, this guy is a wrecking ball. I'd love to see him in a garnet and black. You know, I don't know what the future holds for Dax Holyfield and South Carolina, but he is a fun player to watch. And whoever gets him is going to be getting a good one. Yeah, I think, guys, he's kind of a, a throwback. You know, he's a, he's a tough-nosed kid. He's very, very good against the run. Um, shoot, th- this game he's going to watch, South Carolina versus Arkansas, is the type contest that fits his skill set to a T you know uh old school 4-3 uh, alignment for South Carolina defensively I formation uh run the football this is the type game that you'd you'd actually love if you're South Carolina to have a Dax Holyfield on the on the field because um the, the guy is just a physical type kid that is very very good at getting to the football um he's got to be easily I, I don't follow all of North Carolina high school, but there's no way there's there's many kids that are as productive on the field as far as racking up tackles as uh, Dax Holyfield has been the last couple of years. 
All right, so Dax Holyfield, the linebacker from the Charlotte area, will be in town to check out the Gamecocks in Arkansas this weekend. And one of a handful of recruits that the Gamecocks are on that will be visiting this weekend. So another important part of the game, you know, recruits coming in. The Gamecocks need to make a good impression. Chris, Wes, we appreciate your time today. Thanks for being with us, fellas. We appreciate you joining us. Four o'clock kickoff for the Gamecocks and the Razorbacks. Thanks for being with us on Gamecock Central Radio. Gamecock Central Radio.